Hi everyone and welcome to week 12 data security. We are going to be talking a little bit about database security and why that's important. Talk about some examples and best practices and list some common problems with database security. Um, I am also going to be talking quite a bit about data security in general. So data security in general is about keeping your data safe no matter where it is. So this will also encompass databases, but this is generalized data no matter how it is being stored, whether it's in a database or a spreadsheet or a data warehouse or a data lake. We need to be careful of how the data is being stored, who can access it, and things like that. Data security is based on the CIA principles of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So confidentiality means being able to keep the data secret. Integrity is making sure that it's accurate and it hasn't been changed. And availability means it's there when you need it. So when you want to go access your database, your database is there. Data security will cover the data as it's collected, processed, and saved but it actually will also cover backups of data. Data security should also include some processes to check in to make sure that the things that you are doing are actually doing the things you think they are. What I mean by that is if we are talking about, let's say, a database, well, the data has to be collected for the database and it has to be backed up somewhere and we have to make sure that both the collection and the backup is protected. As it's being processed, it has to be backed up and protected there as well. And as it's being put into the database or the database is being changed, we have to make sure that we have backups of all of those changes. And we have to make sure that we're checking in so that our backups are actually doing the thing that we think they are. So it's really easy to make the assumption, yes, of course my backup is working, but unless you actually go in and check the backups and make sure the correct thing is being backed up in the right spot, everything is working the way that you think it is, you need to be careful not to assume things. So an example of this would be if we're talking about backing up data, we have to make sure, let's say if it's a daily, weekly, monthly, whatever backup, um, that we are going to be going in and making sure that if we need to pull that data, it's going to work. Um, you know, you never want to only check your backup when you need it. That's too late. Data security and data privacy aren't exactly the same. Data security is making our data protected from unauthorized access. Data privacy is about who can or should control who can see our data. So for data security, we might talk about encrypting our data or encrypting our backups, but data privacy might be who can actually access the data that we've saved and should we have a say over that. You can have data security encryption of data without privacy. So an example of this is a lot of companies will keep data about you. Most industries have some variety of rules that are in place about how that data has to be treated. The more sensitive the data, the more protections in place. But that does not necessarily go with data privacy. So when you sign up for most, you know, social media or you use Google searches or you are going anywhere online and you see cookies, the company that is collecting it needs to encrypt and in a lot of cases anonymize the data, which we say anonymize, but it's kind of a lie. Do they know your name? No. Do they know basically everything else about you? Yes. So the name's kind of superfluous. But if that company is collecting all of that information, even if that information is encrypted, that doesn't necessarily matter for your data privacy because you don't really have a say in what's being collected, who's able to see it, who's selling or buying, what's been collected. You know, do you have a right to be forgotten? If you show up on Google, which almost all of us show up on Google, do you have a right to be forgotten by Google? well, what if the things that are on there aren't flattering or they're too personal or uh, it, 
it's lies and slander. Like, you know, at what point do you have the right to be forgotten? Data security is important. There aren't necessarily laws and regulations everywhere to require it. Most places and most industries do have some variety of data security requirement. Data can be stolen. Even in inconsequential data can be valuable. Just because you don't necessarily see the data as valuable does not mean that nobody will see it as valuable. Now there is the sort of, I guess, um, default assumptions about what's valuable, like credit cards, social security numbers, bank info. You know, we see those as valuable because they have very direct monetary consequences. But even things like logins for your email, logins for your social media, your browsing habits, your buying habits, who you're buying for, the buying habits of the people that you hang out with the most, even those potentially inconsequential or seemingly inconsequential pieces of data can still be valuable. Because most things are connected to the internet in some way, it's almost impossible to keep your information off the internet and losing a lot of the access, like for example, your email, is a big problem. For a lot of us, we may have more than one email, but we probably don't have that many that we use that often. So maybe you have an email, maybe you have two emails, and you use them for a lot of your signups. Well, if you have bank information, you probably use one email for that. You might use the same email for other stuff. And if you lost access to that, one of the ways that you can verify you are who you say you are or get uh, some of the codes can actually be a whole big problem. You know, or if somebody clones your SIM card on your phone and you lose access to your text messages, that can mean that you no longer have access to your bank account. Um, or if somebody else gets a copy of that and they get the text message, now they have access to your bank account. And that's actually happened several times where well-known people have lost access to information because somebody else basically um, social engineered it. Now, a lot of companies don't like data security. Um, data security, frankly, involves spending money. And that's not something that companies enjoy. Um, there are really no companies that enjoy or look forward to spending money. Data security costs money. The fines that you get if you don't do your data security well costs money. Any variety of CYA that might happen after a breach also costs money, which means companies end up getting really unhappy when there's more consequences, more rules, more laws, more regulations, more fines. It also makes companies unhappy if there's limits on what can be collected. Companies like to collect more data than is needed. And one of the revenue streams is selling that data to other people. Um, you know, it's actually really common for a company to collect all of this data. And then maybe they use one of the 15 things that they've collected, but they can auction off the other 15 to other people. That's actually one of the reasons why it's important to be careful what you install on your phones. On your phone, most people have smartphones and most people have relatively sensitive information on their phones. You have your address book with your friends' emails and phone numbers, uh, how often you contact them, your text messages, your email, uh, any chat programs that you might use, you know, Discord, WhatsApp, Signal, anything like that. And so if you have an app, even if it's giving you a quote unquote free game, but it asks for your address book so that you can find your friends, well, that's actually valuable because then it can invite your friends. It can get your friends contact info and then I can sell your contact info and your friends contact info. So companies tend to not be a big fan of data security because in general it costs them money. Now, 
that's not to say that we shouldn't care about it. We still should. Laws and regulation should still be put in place to make sure that data security happens. So things like GDPR with the heavy fines should still be happening. Um, but it generally doesn't make companies very happy. Now, data privacy, because it's a little bit more nebulous, what one person considers private versus what another person considers private, that can be a little bit more difficult, so it's a little bit harder to have standards for it. Whereas data security tends to have more standards and more stringent standards, and those standards can happen either by country, by state, or it can happen by industry. So there are some industries that are going to have more regulations than others. So some examples of data security gone wrong. Um, any data breach is really kind of data security gone wrong. Now, that being said, nobody is expecting perfection. Nobody is expecting that, you know, no data breaches will happen ever and will all be perfect. Like that's, that's not the expectation. However, there are... I'm going to say some basic measures that should and aren't put in place relatively frequently that is going to protect our data and our information. I have three examples here. So the first one is there's a company called LifeLock. And basically the entire company's mission statement was to protect your information from getting stolen so that you wouldn't have to worry about identity theft. So their CEO was so proud of it that um, the CEO put their photo and their social security number, their actual real social security number, on billboards. Um, so when these billboards were put in place, the identity was actually stolen 13 times that one year. Now, needless to say, those billboards are no longer in place, and my understanding is that they actually had to request a change of social security number, but that's that would be the kind of thing where you could maybe look at and say, sure, but maybe don't put my social on a billboard. Uh, second example, Logic Monitor. They're actually a data security company, so I would put that in the category of they should have known better. So with this data security company, what happened is their security setup and their security appliance was... And, and this is my understanding from the news articles, obviously. I don't work for Logic Monitor. I've never worked for Logic Monitor. Um, the way that the setup worked, which is common, is you have an admin account or a couple of admin accounts, and then those accounts are used to create everybody else's. So, um, you know, like at companies that I've worked for, what will happen is you get an admin account and maybe one and a backup or two people in a backup will have access. And then that admin is who you go to for access for the other people and the other ones on the team so that you don't have everybody have everything. It's the one person with the procedures that we go through. Anyway, what they ended up doing was actually assigning this admin account and they decided that a reasonable username, for example, they, they ran through a couple from what I understand, so they had several that they used, but an example of one is they had a username of admin. And then their passwords were things like, welcome, one, two, three. And they didn't have requirements on these passwords, so it didn't have, you know, for example, a temporary, this has to be changed in 30 days, which is really common. Um, you know, if you have access to a security appliance and you have to have an admin account like this, what a lot of places will do is they'll give you a username and password and it'll expire in 24 hours, 48 hours, or seven days, something like that. You have to change it and then the password has requ has requirements. So um, usually it's numbers, letters, both lowercase and uppercase, and some variety of symbol. However, they didn't have any of those, and so people had like multiple years where they had, you know, admin and welcome one, two, three as the login information for the security appliance for the company. Example three, Internet of Things. A uh, bunch of cameras were manufactured at a factory, and the cameras had a hard-coded in username password. 
Now by hard-coded, I mean they actually put this into the ROM of the camera. So there is literally no way to change it or override it. And the developers put it in so that they can check on the camera easily. They knew they could always have access. They could troubleshoot remotely because these were Wi-Fi connected cameras, by the way. And so these hard-coded in username password combos, which were then written down in plain text and widely shared, went to a whole bunch of different cameras that were then put into cameras that were resold. So this was doorbells, this was baby monitors, this was IP cams, this was security cams, and all of these had a hard-coded in, not able to be changed username password. And all of the passwords on the list were very simple, you know, admin, 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 password, one, two, three, four, type of thing. So those are some examples of data security gone wrong where people should have known better. Current best practices. So um, I do have links in here for you to go to. And so these are going to be up to date best practices. Now, I ended up including the U.S. government because most people are likely in the U.S. or from the U.S. However, your government, if you are not from the U.S., may have a list of resources as well. I did also include a voting security best practices as an example of what a framework for cybersecurity can look like. Um, I included voting because we vote frequently, and if you don't, you should be voting frequently, and it's something that comes up quite a bit. So best practices include things like keeping up good cyber hygiene. So that's going to be things like strong passwords, updating all of your software, using multi-factor authentication, which is two of the three factors. So for a lot of people, it's something you know and something you have. That's where you have like passwords and then text message verification or pin number and card like a debit card or password and a phone call a lot of uh, banks and credit cards will do that and so that's an example of some best practices for data security there's actually an entire set of framework that most of the industries will go through and follow but that's kind of the big ones that everybody will be using Reputable sources. Um, it is important to make sure that you are paying attention to what's happening in data security. The laws and regulations may not change that frequently. However, you should still be appraised of what's going on. Government, whatever your government site happens to be, again, I'm using US government because that's where I am, that's where I'll lot of you probably are but you can use a government for wherever you are instead but government sites are a good place to start see who they're referencing seeing where they direct look at the top level domain a lot of top level domains will be gov so in the example uh, NIST is a good place to start and the CISA are good places to start and so those are somewhere that we can get reputable checked data if you want more information, try nonprofits. Look for .org as the top level domain. Nonprofits with a .org top level domain. To be able to get that domain, you have to follow some particular criteria and you have to prove that you're a nonprofit. Nonprofits are more likely to not have skin in the game, as it were. So if you go for a nonprofit, like for example, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, they are less likely to be a problem because they're less likely to have bias and they're less likely to sell you things. One of the problems is that a lot of what's being found online is either straight up lies or trying to sell you something or con you for something in some way. So it's really important that you think about where you're getting your information from. Now they do have a downside, both has a downside. Um, because governments and nonprofits aren't trying to get profits, they also have no monies. Um, money is how we do research. And so if they have no money, <laughs> they don't have as much research. 
they might not have the money to fund the research. They might not be updating it as frequently. In some cases, it's, you know, volunteer run. So sure, it gets updated, but it gets updated when the volunteers can do it. You don't necessarily know how or when that's going to work. So that does have the downside. Next sort of tier of option is research papers. Research papers that are published in, and this is important, reputable journals. Reputable journals is really the key here because you want research that has been vetted by experts in some way. You don't want just, look, I've published it on Google. Anybody can publish anything on Google, whereas if you're talking about reputable research through a reputable journal, it's gone through an entire review process. So it's more likely that the things that are being said are actually accurate and can be backed up. The downside to research papers written by researchers and published in reputable journals for other researchers. They tend to be complex topics and they tend to not be as sort of industry focused because most researchers are at educational institutions. There is the problem that that's where they're focused. They're really not looking at what's happening in industry. Um, and I also say this, being a professor myself and talking to a lot of other professors, um, they also, especially in research papers, there's not a lot of encouragement to make it sound like reasonable speech. One of the big issues with research papers is let's just say they use $10 words. And maybe that's not a problem for you. Maybe it's really easy for you to understand, but a lot of research papers will have an abstract to tell you what the entire paper is going to show, but that's really as close as you're going to be able to get to sort of a real person could understand this who is not an expert in the field. Um, they can also be boring as all get out, which is a completely separate issue in education where things can just be boring until you want to shriek, which is part of why I have my little cartoons and memes everywhere. Okay, so next tier, well-known conferences. I use RSA and Black Hat. Um, however, there's a lot of really well-known conferences. The really well-known conferences have requirements for speakers. All of the speakers go through vetting. The talks go through vetting. Experts will say, yes, this is reasonable. No, this isn't reasonable. Um, you know, they'll talk about, is this sort of well done enough to present right now? has this got any proof? So there's a lot of sort of checks and balances to make sure that what's going out there is actually good. So if we're talking about, and this is, all of these things are true no matter where you're getting your information, not just data security, but for data security or security in general, you want to make sure that everything's been vetted by experts. So check out conferences, check out conference talks, just make sure that they are vetted conferences by experts. And then last but not least is companies will sometimes have good resources. Companies will have something called white papers, which is basically just like, hey, I found this thing. I'm going to write about it. Let me share it with you too. Some companies will actually have this set aside time, not all of them, but like in the example for security, because I, I know cybersecurity companies, is they will sometimes have, you know, a certain amount of time set out every week or every month for the people that work for the company to go do their own research and then give them the time that they need to publish this research as white papers, as these informational reports. And then the company will push them out on their blogs and websites and journals and they'll go to, you know, sort of regular reputable journals. It'll go out to the company. I'll go out to everybody. Um, so that's another good resource, but you do need to be wary of agendas. It is completely possible to have white papers that don't have agendas. However, it is also not uncommon to have white papers that are sponsored by a company that happens to be where the company is an expert and happens to be where the company is going next. 
not necessarily in a, you know, we're trying to scam you kind of a way, but like if you have 10 people working for the company and they all found this thing that they thought was cool enough to do extra research for it, they're going to make the argument to the company why the company should go in that direction. So then they have a white paper or multiple white papers and the company going in that direction. So it's not necessarily like sus or anything, but it's something to be aware of. So those are some ways that you can get more information for data security and make sure that the information that you're getting is accurate. Data security for big business versus small business. Big businesses are more profitable, they have larger weak spots. Small companies might not be as profitable, but the hits do more damage. So a big company, you know, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, they have dedicated security teams and they have red teams, purple teams, like they, they have people, they have the funding. So the data that gets stolen might be more valuable, but they also have more people to protect it. And, you know, if Facebook loses $100,000, that's honestly probably not going to make them really blink an eye. Your local pizza parlor loses $100,000, they might fold. So, you know, um, one of the things, a small example, if you shop locally, which by the way, PS, consider shopping locally and consider paying cash when you can so that they don't have to foot the credit card bills, is if you go shop locally and the point of sale system is down, how many people walk away? How many people don't purchase things, how many people might say, oh, I'm going to come back later and then go somewhere else or have it shipped from some online store that we're not naming so that they can have two day delivery instead of doing it. So, you know, the point of sale system getting taken down for 24 hours, 48 hours, especially on like a weekend or something, you know, that, that can be a big problem for a small company. Whereas, you know, big businesses, if they lost two days of business, that's a, that's a much bigger problem, but they're also much less likely to be down for two days. Big companies also have more capacity to collect, store, and process data, which means they can also sell more of the data. Smaller companies, by definition, will have less resources. It's harder to find security professionals. It's harder to find somebody to take care of things. That's why a lot of companies won't actually have, for example, databases. Big companies will probably have multiple databases with teams of data analysts to work on their data, whereas small companies can't afford to have even one person do their tech. And having a tech person that does sort of the, you know, Jack or Jill of all trades type of thing is really tough. Some top threats to data security, these aren't the only ones, but user apathy is actually a really huge issue. It's really hard to convince people to care about their personal data, where their personal data is going, and most of the corporate systems are completely set up to get you to share data. Um, you know, if you pay bills of any variety, you'll probably ask for your phone number and social security number a surprising amount of times. And it is really not advertised that you don't actually always have to give it. And you will actually, trust me, I know this, this happens to me, confuse the people that are on the other end of the line if you refuse to give it as a way of identifying you. So it's like the system is literally not set up for you to say, no, I don't want you to have my data actually. Um, you know, this happens to me with phone numbers all the time. I'm actually super, super protective of my phone number. I like never give it out. So all of the rewards cards and loyalty cards, their default is, oh yes, of course, if you don't have your card, don't worry about it, what's your phone number? But they don't have my phone number because I refuse to give it because it's actually not required for the loyalty card. And so it ends up confusing people. Oh, well, no, but you have to. No, actually, you don't. If you look at the terms of service, there's nothing that says I'm required to give you my phone number. I'm required to give you a contact info, which can be anything of my choice. It doesn't say phone number. Um, which, on a side note, a little hack to get around that, if you are... I'm going to go with old like me. There was a song that had a phone number, uh, 8675309. I will not sing it. You're welcome. And you can actually use that with your local area code. And a lot of people use that to sign up. 
Uh, another big threat is poor credential management. One of the things that happens a lot in corporate is shared logins, weak passwords, and poorly secured machines. So a lot of people tend not to be as, I guess I would say, precious about the logins for uh, appliances or machines if they aren't personal logins. So, you know, a personal login of, you know, Susie needs to log in. Well, Susie is probably going to be protective about it, but if it's just the HR login, that probably goes to everybody by HR. Well, and then we have to make it a reasonable and easy to remember password so that everybody in HR can do it without a problem. So you can see where that is kind of going. Backups are important for data security because data security, databases, if we lose our data, we are up a creek without a paddle. Keeping it safe is part of the battle, but you also have to make sure that you have access to it. You have to make sure that the data isn't being lost. All of our backups need to have the same protections as the original data. So if you have a database and it has three rules in place for how to secure the data, your backups need to have the same rules. The backups will also need to be checked to make sure that if something happens, the database is, I don't know, erased by a freak lightning strike. It can then be loaded up again with very minimal hassle. Backups also need backups. It's important to have contingency plans. Now, this can be, you know, backup of the backup of the backup of the backup. We don't need to go crazy about that, but it is important to think about what's the contingency plan. Think of the value of the data. What are you willing to lose? Make sure that you back up anything you're not willing to lose, whether that's a full day of the database work, a half day of the database work, an hour of the database work, 10 minutes of the database work, whatever that happens to be, that's when you, where you need to set your backups for. Data erasure goes with backups. When we talk about we can erase our data, well, kind of. So it is possible to lose data. An example of this would be a hard drive gets fried. Hard drives get fried, I think 20% in the first two years was the last I heard for uh, physical hard drives, not SSDs. When Windows erases files, it actually just erases the pointer to the start of the file. The file doesn't actually get erased. To actually erase the, hard, the file, you have to wipe the hard drive and then rewrite over it. The reason that this goes with data security and our databases is if we have data that we're saving and we're putting it on machines, we have to make sure that we're actually wiping the data for realsies, not just erasing the pointer to the data. This ends up being really important because most hardware has data on it. Most hardware that we have in a business, this can be printers, routers, photocopiers, they all have hard drives. They all have data. And in a lot of cases, they will save your data. You know, photocopiers will save what you photocopied. It will save the things that were sent to it. It'll save the things that were faxed to it. Yes, people still use fax machines. Um, printers will save the last things that they printed. Routers will save the people that logged in, the where it was going, like all of that. So it's important to think about not just how do we back this up, but when we're done with it, let's say the hard drive or the hardware, how do we make sure that it, it is actually protected? You should care about data security because your data should be yours and you should be able to choose what's going on with it. Some people may have risks that you don't and different people will have different opinions on what they consider private. Think about other people's vulnerabilities as well. Maybe it's not important for you, but that doesn't mean it's not important for anyone. So it's worth thinking about if you are working for a company, what you can advocate for, for data security for you and for others. Data can also be used to manipulate you in small ways and in large ways. And it's important to know that that's happening. So again, once you're working for a company, you can hopefully argue for better data security, better data privacy, and why that's important. So that was the week on data security. I hope you are all having a lovely day.